comes to tyrants, there are names that you definitely recognize. People who are notorious for ruling their own people with an iron fist and showing absolutely no mercy for outsiders. But there may have been some names that flew under the radar. But do not be mistaken, they had their fair share of tyranny. And just like in every profession, there are rules that you must follow in order to get the results that you want. To attain the title of absolute dictator, you need to have mastered the craft. So let's take you through some of these rules while telling the story of someone who followed them perfectly. Almost. This is a story of a forgotten tyrant. General Sani Obacha was a Nigerian military officer with a very interesting character. Uh, not a lot of people know about him, uh, you know, especially when it came to his personal life. He was reserved, he didn't talk too much, he was virtually void of emotion in the eyes of the public. But what we do know, and perhaps what would be more relevant for discussion, is his military career. He was actually the first Nigerian army officer to become a general without skipping any single rank. Let me give some context here. What is now the country Nigeria used to be a British colony starting in the 1900s. And the country has a population made of over 500 languages and over a thousand ethnic groups and dialects. But there are three predominant ones. The Hausa up here, the Yoruba down here in the west, and the Igbo in the east. Now what happened was that all these different cultures were merged into one. And even though the country gained independence from the British in 1960, the new struggle became what ethnic group would lead the country. Now combine this with a lot, and I mean a lot, of oil. And what that leaves you with is a bunch of people fighting over who controls the country and therefore the wealth. And so you have a series of military coups. Some were completely bloodless and others were not. And how do you know how to get this power for yourself? It's simple. Practice. And what you might find more interesting about General Obasha's military career was that he was involved in every single military coup that happened during his career. He was involved in the coup in 1966, he fought during the Civil War, he even played a dominant role in the 1983 coup, which brought a new person into power in the 1985 coup that took the same person out. Funny enough, the same general that was brought in and taken out is the civilian president of Nigeria right now. So what are the steps for anyone looking to get into the profitable business of tyranny? Step 1. Take control. Tyrants usually have a significant crisis surrounding their seizure of power. For a long time, Muammar Gaddafi, the Libyan dictator, spoke against the Western-backed monarchy that he called corrupt, and he ended up taking them down in a coup as well. Same thing with Idi Amin. When he rose to power, he rallied all his people against their former colonizer, Britain. And of course, Hitler ruled a Germany that suffered from great inflation and unemployment because of World War I. So what was Abacha's struggle? Okay, pay attention. The previous head of state, who was from the Hausa tribe, had been in power for eight years, and he decided that he wanted to transition into a democratic government. However, it didn't really go as planned. The candidate that he wanted to put in place didn't win the election. Instead, someone from the Yoruba tribe won. Obviously, he didn't like that, and so he did what everyone would do in that situation. He annulled the election. But people didn't really like that. They were outraged. And in an attempt to appease them, he installed his own Yoruba tribe candidate, who they still weren't really a fan of. And there comes a bunch of national broadcast saying enough is enough and the chaos is too much. The country needs a leader who will take control and lead the country the right way. And so immediately, power was seized. He set up a couple of decrees to expand his power. Decrees 12 and 14, for example, eliminated the jurisdiction of the court of law and basically dissolved a person's right to trial. He fired the Minister of Justice for disagreeing with his decrees and innocent citizens or activists who he felt like had a little bit too much to say were detained. Sounds easy, right? Step 2. Crush your rivals. And for the most part, the opposition were swayed with money. Even the vice president-elect that was overthrown joined Abacha's cabinet, along with some pro-democracy activists. And what about the others? Pardon? 
And what about the others? Oh, they were exiled, imprisoned, or executed. There are a couple lines of action to crush your enemies. Everyone has a price. Most politicians are in it for the money anyway. And so you could really just pay them. At the end of the day, even though your word is law, you can't rule alone. You need a loyal team. And where there is money to be made, there will always be people loyal to the cause. So where does the money come from? The thing is, Nigeria has a lot of resources. It's the largest crude oil producer in Africa, despite there being a lot of mismanagement. There were efforts before Obacha's regime to privatize the nation's resources, and of course, all of them were reversed. You want the country to control the resources, because you control the country. It's that simple. And now you have access to billions. Billions that you could use to sway the decisions of your opposition, arm yourself personally with up to 3,000 officers, and strengthen your country's military, because they now enforce the law. And you also get to keep a lot of this money for yourself. Although Abacha might have taken a bit too much home. Just a bit. It's estimated that Abacha and his family stole between 1 to 5 billion dollars. Now this was done with different methods, but a common way of doing it was that he would ask his national security advisor to provide fake national security funding requests. And when he would provide them, the money would be taken often in cash from the central bank through the security advisor straight to Abacha's home. And from there, the money laundering would be outsourced. But um, it's estimated that about $1.4 billion was stolen this way. With literally billions in your pockets, everything seems to be going well. But even now, there seem to be some pesky threats. You see, the people that live on the particular pieces of land where all your money comes from, they don't think they're getting their fair share. Obviously, something's not clicking in their heads, because, um, last time I checked, everything belongs to me. The Ogoni people are a smaller ethnic group in southern Nigeria, which are the more oil-rich areas. Now, even though to a large extent the majority of the country's income is derived from this area, the people are denied infrastructure like schools and health care. And so in 1990, they submitted a Bill of Rights to the regime, demanding for more control over their land, among other requests that were all denied. But the goal was this, let the regime see us as a threat, and when they inevitably try to silence us, the international community will take notice. The plan worked, but maybe a bit too well. The spokesmen for the Ogonis, along with nine of their leaders, were executed by the regime in November 1995. And it did bring international attention to Nigeria. There was backlash from other African leaders, the United Nations, NGOs, and they were even suspended from the British Commonwealth. The European Union started reviewing its diplomatic relations with Nigeria, and the Canadian government imposed sanctions. They voted to stop buying Nigerian oil, they closed foreign aid, and they wanted the United States to do the same. All of this forced the Nigerian government to begin the transition to democracy. And that was really the beginning of the fall. Now, if we're being honest, there's usually more chaos surrounding the fall of a dictator. In 1945, it was clear that Germany was losing the war, and the Soviets had managed to enter Berlin to finish their job. Hitler, who was having a nervous breakdown, went and got married to his mistress, went into a bunker, and took his life. Idi Amin took Uganda to war against Tanzania, who utterly destroyed the army. And when he saw that he was next, he fled the country and ended up in Saudi Arabia, and he never came back. In Abacha's case, however, on the 8th of June 1998, Abacha had died in the presidential villa. Now, there are many speculations about his death, some suggesting that he was poisoned by his mistress, but his chief security officer strongly believes that he was poisoned by Israeli operatives. Now, the problem is, the cause of death is really unknown because following Muslim tradition, Abacha was buried the same day that he died and he was buried without an autopsy. So my guess is, we'll never know. 